Okay, as in go. Sorry, one second. Fork Tales, a podcast that feeds the food and beverage world. Oh, awesome. Fork Tales is brought to you by Vigor, a branding and marketing agency for passion-driven, innovative restaurant, beverage, and hospitality brands. Learn more at vigorbranding.com. If you love what we're serving up, please give Fork Tales a five-star review on your podcast service of choice. Think of it as a tip for good service. Everyone, today I'm joined by Kelly Valade, President and CEO of Black Box Intelligence. Uh, Black Box has been on my radar for a while now, but specifically in the pandemic, where uh, the organization was just sending through tons of data and content around the effects of the pandemic on restaurants. And I've just been absolutely enamored with the amount of data that comes from you guys. Kelly, uh, feel free to say hello. I'd love to know a little bit about your background and how you got into this position. Yeah, awesome. Good morning. Well, I love that introduction because uh, I, I love anyone that enjoys reading our, not only our data, but our insights at such a critical time for so many, you know, in a dark time for so many, but for our industry, an industry I grew up in, uh, it's a it's a, 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 an amazing time for discovery and innovation at the same time that it has been really dark and unprecedented, like so many people have talked about. So uh, we're doing, we're trying to do our little part at Black Box Intelligence, and I'll tell you more in a second, but our little part to just try and make the industry better. We are about revealing insights that unlock potential for our customers and allow them to enrich lives for operators everywhere. And that passion for what we do in terms of our benchmarks and our data and the insights that we share with the industry in many formats, this being a, another just, just great way to do it, um, you know, the, the, the backdrop to all of it is we are a company by operators for operators. So we're a sub subscription-based business today operating in the, this is the only vertical we operate in, in the food service industry or ecosystem. And we have 300 companies that subscribe to our benchmarks around workforce, financial, and even guest satisfaction. And in turn, because we're collecting all that great, rich data, um, we're able to tell a story for what's happening. And, and in this last year, people have needed that story. They've needed that lifeline. They've needed to know, am I doing better or worse than others? Um, what are the most resilient brands doing? Uh, and for somebody that has spent their entire career in restaurants, uh, it's been uh, it, it's just been an honor to, to try and do whatever in, in whatever little way. We're a small, but I like to say we're a small, but mighty company, small in that we're we're, we're a tiny company here based in Dallas. I'm working out of my bedroom like so many have been, um, but we're mighty in terms of the <laughs> amount of data out of insights and directionally what that can do for operators to help them move forward, especially at a time like this. Um, my background just quickly is I got here because uh, I've only worked in this industry, this industry that I absolutely love. Uh, I started at 16 at a small restaurant in upstate New York and uh, have worked for great brands like TGI Fridays and for great brands at Brinker International, where I spent 22 years um, working with a lot of brands in the Brinker portfolio, but most notably, uh, the latter part of my career was at Chili's Grill and Bar, and I was the chief operating officer and then brand president when I left after 22 years there. Uh, joined Black Box and uh, now look at it from a, it's really now a, a bird's eye view. You know, it's a, a, a very high level view of what's happening in the industry, the things that continue to make this industry great. And then frankly, the things that still challenge uh, this industry as well as others, but this industry, you know, that is so powerful, um, that has been profoundly impacted and, and needs our, our kind of support and help. So that's a little bit about us at Black Box and, and how I came to, to, to join and be a part of this. That's awesome. Yeah, I have a, a little bit of a funny story about Fridays. Uh, I was tapped to comment on the, uh, I believe it was all you can eat appetizer promotion underneath <laughs> Mr. Shepard. Uh, I believe that's who it was. And I was not nice. 
um, in, in my commentary. And after that hit the uh, the, the proverbial digital newsstands, uh, Mr. Shepard reached out to me and was like, hey, can we talk? And so I, I went to Nashville to meet with him and have a, a good discussion about Friday's uh, journey and future and all that. Uh, it was one of those dad's pissed moments, um, <laughs> yeah. but it was great to interface with him. He was a great guy. And did he change um, You your mentioned mind? a lot of drastic uh, I, I love to hear what was happening inside the organ, like inside the kitchen, quite literally. I, um, it was great to get a peek behind that curtain because, um, there were a lot of great things that shifted. Um, the unfortunate thing I think with a, a ship that big is it's really hard to change the outer face yeah. and affect what the consumer perceptions of a brand that is doing pivotal things in the kitchen. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I was on the other end of that, watching that promotion take off <laughs> as a competitor at Chili's. Mm -hmm. And as brand president, when that happened, I I, I had a different viewpoint, probably. Uh, but along the same lines, it sounds like as yours. So yeah, that's great. Great context. Yeah. Yeah, it was specifically great to understand the, the change in dynamic uh, in the back of the house when they started stepping away from what I lovingly call prison food, which is the, the food comes in bags, you heat them up and dump them. Um, and, and doing things like handmade patties and how uh, the, the folks in the kitchen uh, developed a stronger respect for what they were doing compared to that other stuff. So it's a, definitely a play in human dynamic um, and behaviors. Um, speaking of behaviors, a lot of those have shifted. So you mentioned a lot of the challenges and, and potentially dark times for restaurants. Um, the pandemic's drastically changed everything. I think we all know that. What were some of the most surprising shifts that you've seen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has absolutely, I think, changed us all forever, I think, I would dare to say. Uh, I think it's changed, us, uh, changed consumers, changed employees, changed the face of things. However, one of the things that I am uh, incredibly bullish on is that the restaurant industry, you know, second largest industry only to the government, um, it will thrive again. It's an industry where you don't just go uh, and die, choose to dine out. You know, every meal comes with something way beyond just the food, right? It's either a chance to connect with your family at your own table or a chance to celebrate or just break bread with friends. And there's joy in that. And there's uh, a chance to be seen in that. And that is, to me... There's a very, you know, much a, a kind of higher um, purpose. I like to say the restaurants, re the word for a restaurant is it really comes from a French word that has to do more with restoration. The literal translation of restaurant is, is not about food. It's about restoration. And the meaning behind the French word is to provide for. So restaurants provide in so many ways, right? Today, one of the most outwardly, um, uh, you know, different behaviors is, I, I want to return to that joy again. There's been all sorts of studies and we have them too on pent up demand. People want to get back out. However, if you looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and said, what's the first order of, you know, in, in there, it's, it's about safety. It's safety and physiological needs before you can ever think of higher intimacy kind of, you know, uh, uh, values and, and meeting those needs. We are still at square one. I will go out if it's safe for most people. There are some that have been first out the door no matter what. But safety is something that uh, is, is paramount and profoundly important to every, you know almost every guest out there. Are you clean? You know, I'm not getting, I won't get into the mask debate, but it's there still. But there are brands that have taken a stand. And, and first and foremost, you may, you may be able to capture some guests, but there are many that are still going to your website, understanding they're still enforcing things, understanding what your COVID protocols are. I, I think that's going to, that there's, there's definitely going to be something that's a big hangover there. Um, but I also think now one of the other big behavior shifts that we're all aware of is this shift to off premise and to go and find, you know, alcohol to go in, in many States and just finding different ways to get your sustenance. Right. And restaurateurs got really scrappy and really innovative as they always do uh, and figured out how to not only, sell food in their parking lots or take the technology that they had on the tables in some cases for casual diners and start using it for contactless pay in the parking lots, right? Uh, and figuring out how to meet the demand through every provider out there um, that would let them get food to people. But then they went beyond that and said, I'm not just going to serve you a cooked meal. I'll give you ingredients because your grocery store is out of them. And then they went on to say, and you know what, then there's free toilet paper with that, right? So 
I, I love what restaurateurs do when up against something that nobody has figured out. And that kind of innovation is there in so many other, so many other industries. There's examples there everywhere, but I up close and personal watching some of the best restaurants out there um, do right in their communities when it wasn't going well for them either, giving food away when they, to some extent, didn't have it to give away. And when they were really, you know, down, uh, finding ways to, to give back and, and to lean into that idea of it's about restoration and providing for. So restaurateurs provide wherever they can. And I think that's the cool thing that came out of it. But uh, safety, number one, the joy of dining out will return. It's not still not so fun uh, and still not so relaxed yet. Um, but we've got a new lever to pull because I can still get that great food in my house in a lot of different ways now. And and I think consumers now, those that weren't familiar with apps and DoorDash and Uber Eats and all the other providers are now familiar. So they're not going to unlearn it. So whenever they need to feel safe, it's going to toggle back to frictionless, contactless. Uh, and the players that have those things in place and are steadfast about it will the ones be the ones that continue to win, in my opinion. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the food being able to be, <clears throat> excuse me, made in house and bringing it home and that that home moment. When we talk about finding competitors and doing competitive analysis, um, we we make the joke. It's like, well, technically everybody's the competitor, including yes. the patron themselves, because they can make the food. And during the pandemic, we saw a, a huge resurgence in home cooking and culinary enthusiasm. Um, not to make everything about me, but. I got even better at cooking and I was already pretty right. good to yeah. the point now and making drinks and to the point now when I go, when I do get a chance to go out and eat, um, I'm, I'm really big. I'm very critical because I'm like, yeah. wait a second, I could have done this so much better in my house. <laughs> and so yeah. I feel like the, the ante has been upped. Um, how, how have you seen, how much have you seen people, um, adopting the make it at home as opposed to getting from a restaurant. And do you really feel like we'll, we'll see a slingshot back to uh, the heavy uh, traffic in restaurants that we saw pre pandemic? Yes, I am actually pretty bullish and optimistic that you will. It, again, it, I think it will toggle and move and ebb and flow with safety as first priority and comfort with what's happening. I don't think we're completely out of the woods yet, although there's still some reason to be very optimistic today. You definitely saw a resurgence of, and frankly, I have cooked more in the last year and I was pretty decent at it before. I'm tired of it. So as soon as I can get back to Friday night, date nights with my husband and not really have to worry about being outside on a patio, removed from everybody, wearing my mask to the restroom, I'm doing it, you know? And so I'm a little exhausted by it, which I think is what you'll see. There are studies that have been done and we, we follow and partner with lots of folks to complement our research. And there are studies done about, you know, what's the one, two, and three, you know, number one, two, and three things you'll do when you can. And restaurants was second. It was get my hair cut freely, right? Not, not that people have it now. A year later, of course, people have done it. But you remember mm -hmm. how many Zooms in the beginning where people were growing beards and no one had colored their hair and, you know, and we have figured out how to do it and navigate it. But it, it's still, it, there's no, you know, again, there's no joy in it. There's still joy in going and shopping in retail when most of your stuff still isn't there. So you go back to online. Um, so I think that I think there's pent up demands. I know that from research, but I also know from the consumer that in reading our data and our guest intelligence platform, that the consumer is actually more forgiving, maybe than maybe than you. No, no, no offense there. I get it. There's still there's maybe an elevated bar, but the, to a great extent, if I can be out and I can relax, and you have shown me it's safe and that you care enough to put those things in place. I, I, we're seeing really strong service scores, really strong ambiance scores. And ambiance, another French word, right? It's a, a fancy word for how clean is this place? How, what, what do I see as I look around? How much energy? And the scores have shot through the roof. So we have coined the phrase at Black Box over the last six months that clean is the new ambiance. That ambiance used to be the smells, the senses, the food, the energy. And it's now down to the biggest movement in ambiance is clean. And clean as directly tied to COVID. So, and when those things are in place, to your point about, do I have an elevated expectation? Maybe, but when those things are in place, it's got a halo on the entire experience, right? The last thing I'll say about that is watch the commercials today, just today. Watch how many commercials you see of a quick, uh, quick service brand, fast food brand, fast casual, full service. If you see, there's not a lot of full service commercials right now. Um, watch them tell you why we can make it better because we have all the right ingredients and it's something you can't make at home. 
That's the perfect pivot for a restaurant right now. Um, so if you have your, you still have a mouthpiece and it's still advertising, tell them why you don't have all these unique ingredients to make it as good as we can. It's to combat that belief that, well, I've been doing this at home, so why go out, right? For those that may be more hesitant, right? Um, the last thing I'll say in a very long answer is that we also track consumer spend in home meal replacement offerings, HelloFresh, Blue Apron. And though they have, they have grown in this pandemic, they are a really small percentage of the share of wallet of the total population. So it feels, and that's including like an, even an Amazon fresh card, online grocery and meals delivered that way is still really, really small. So people are, they still want to go out, go through a drive through go sit down at a restaurant. And uh, I, I think it'll take some time, um, but there will be, people will return to that joy of, of dining out again. That's great. Yeah. You know, so I don't, I don't mean to put you in a compromising position, but I will. Um, I think what we saw was brands, the, the casual full service restaurants, the, the Applebee's, the, uh, the Fridays, the Chili's, um, the Ruby Tuesday's. They were they were already sort of on thinner ice. I, I wouldn't say they were ready to collapse, but they definitely were struggling, uh, considering uh, or in comparison to the fast casual boom and this that, and the other. Do you think that they use this opportunity to pivot to a more fast casual model, double down on their full service casual, or do you think this will be the death blow for some of them? Mm, yeah, you're, uh, it's not a compromising position. Again, I'm going to take the glass half full kind of answer to that in that you are absolutely right. The premise of your your question or argument is exactly right. Casual dining restaurants were being oversaturated as the whole industry. You know, there's been a saturation oversupply problem in restaurants for a long time. In the restaurant space, this huge industry, massive industry, has anywhere from 900,000 to a million rooftops or locations. That's how big this $880 billion industry is, right? And the demand has, it really was a story for the last decade about, maybe even longer, about when will we all learn and stop growing restaurants so that the demand will actually you know, meet up with the supply. This has right-sized restaurants in total. And it didn't just affect, it has affected full service a little bit more, but it has affected independence a little bit more, but it's definitely affected and it's right-sized it a little bit and it will be helpful. That's not the way we want to get it at all. So many great operations, you know, will not make it all the way through. We track, and it's about 8%, 7 to 8% of locations either temporarily closed or permanently closed. To get to full service, yeah, was fast casual, you know, um, dominating going into this? Sure, but it's all... There's, you, you know, if you watch it over a long enough time period, you see that fast food um, was really struggling when casual dining got better. Fast casual comes into the, to, to the market. There's room for all. Um, and I think the stronger brand you'll now see, regardless of segment, the stronger brands will still continue to emerge. Uh, they may close down under performing locations. It'll only make them a little bit stronger. Um, you've got some casual diners saying, well, maybe I'll look for drive through now. You know, so they're going to continue to innovate. Um, and uh, a little bit of the tale of haves and have nots will continue to exist for a while around quick service and fast casual looking a little bit stronger. Um, but it, but it, back to my original idea of the joy of dining out, well, it, it means something still. It's it's part of you know society and, and a big part of it. And uh, so I think I think they'll they'll come back. It will not break them. It will not break them. Although again, you'll see underperforming locations with big brands close down. But all that did was exacerbate something that, you know, the pandemic exacerbated something that was already there in terms of right sizing it a little bit for the demands. Yeah. That's one of the things I uh, um, <clears throat> recently brought up in a, in a clubhouse group is uh, that there, there were issues prior to the pandemic. And, and I think those issues will, you know, mean either the adjustment or the death, unfortunately, of some, uh, if it hasn't happened already. But as with any tragedy, like a forest fire, the forest comes back, comes back stronger, comes back better. Um, and I think with pain points comes the need and the demand and the spark of innovation. And I think uh, I'm excited to see what happens next. And we're already seeing some mm -hmm. great stuff. Um, yeah. You know, who would have thought that Shake Shack would start introducing a drive through um, right. <laughs> you know, right. a fast, casual player adopting a QSR mentality. Right. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so another huge pain point that I think probably will get a lot of heads nodding, whoever's listening to this, is staff, the people, the team. And finding really good uh, talent or um, folks who can develop skills quickly and effectively was already a big issue facing, I think, the entire industry. Um, and now you've added in being completely shut down, the fear of going to work in a place that could put you in danger of uh, getting ill and uh, not to get political, but the aspect of paying people for staying home, which we saw. So they don't want to come back because they're already getting money from the government. Uh, they're getting more money in some cases than they would have at their salary. Uh, I think the I don't even want to use the pandemic anymore as a word, but there is a pandemic of talent that got exacerbated yeah. by this. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing there? Do you think it, yeah. it's going to get better? Yeah, great. it's great. And you're so right, again, in your premise and your assumptions about what, what has been happening. I have often, so my background is human resources as well as operations. So I spent the first 15 or so years of my career running Wonderful. HR uh, because I was I, I, I was passionate about the business impact of work, great workforce practices. And by the way, that's what we do at Black Box as well. We track those workforce practices. We've tracked them for 25 years. And to your point, what I can tell you is not enough has changed. And I can also tell you as an operator, it's hard. <laughs> it's really, really difficult. So this was an industry already plagued by understaffing, high, high turnover in some cases, um, and just so much movement. And the only, you know, one of the best ways to run a fantastic operation is to have low turnover and to be staffed. It's, it's, you know, it's simple and simple is really hard in this case. So it was, I have often been known to do a keynote and an industry presentation and to back into the workforce scenario and say, I just want to remind you how broken it was before. So what do you think is going to happen now? Broken meaning understaffed, lack of engagement. I've done studies with, we've done studies and partnered with Gallup, the Gallup organization, and we know they're less engaged in this industry than other industries, right? Some of that is, again, the, the, maybe the type of work, the hours, all those things. It happen, happens to be something I, I absolutely love. And uh, as they say, gets in your blood and you get kind of addicted to it, but it's hard work, right? And it's, you know, this is kind of the backbone for us. Um, so with that said, the backdrop, yes, was was rough to begin with. Is it going to get any easier? Absolutely not. This is where I will continue to say restaurants are going to have to think about doing something very, very different. Um, I, I watched brands, so many great brands that first and foremost did whatever they could to take care of their people, furlough them before they would let them go permanently, You know, tried to keep their benefits on, tried to keep them thinking optimistically, maybe this pandemic lasts three months and we'll bring you back. And then fast forward to June and July, not better, Stimulus checks come out, maybe making it a little bit more difficult to get the same people. And now they're all understaffed again. So uh, we're getting people back to work. They're not the same people, which means turnover. And our metrics would tell you turnover is through the roof again, uh, of, of course, obvious for obvious reasons. But there has to be a solution that is different than what we're doing today. Couple that with the uh, what I would call the other pandemic and the other true crisis is around well-being. The true crisis that started to emerge over many years, uh, there's a Cigna Health study I quote often in 2018 that said 50% of people were lonely, are lonely. In 2018, in 19, it went up to 60. What do you think it's going to be now? So we have a crisis of kind of mental wellness and well being. We are more alone than ever, sitting isolated now, not just, right? We were isolated before with, with a phone in hand and connection to thousands of people, but we still felt alone. And I have teenagers and I watch the difference in the dynamic of, you know, the way they're growing up versus what um, maybe me, I'll speak to myself, but uh, it's a, there's a crisis of well-being. Restaurants not only need to think about staffing differently and there are tools everywhere to do it. They're going to have to break the mold from what they do today and the way they find people today um, to different solutions that are a little bit more advanced and maybe uh, just take a leap, not, iterative changes, but a leap into something that's different. Uh, on the wellness front, restaurants will have to make more programs available, uh, lean in more than ever before into their own DNA, um, but into their employees and making sure wellness is a priority. I, I, I can't say that enough. So uh, it's not going to get any easier is the you know long and short answer to your, your question. Yeah, if there was ever a soundbite... Um... That that's that's the one right there. Um, 
<clears throat> excuse me. So I, I, I'm preaching to the choir. I know, uh, knowledge is power. And when, when you know more, you can do more. And I think one of the things that black box brings to the world is knowledge, data, information. And tell me, I, I guess, give, give us the viewer or the viewers, the listeners and myself, just a, a, a swath of the kind of information that can be garnered from black boxes, uh, pool of data and how operators and leaders in the restaurant industry can use that to take that wild leap, take that big leap. Yeah. I, so I love what you said. Knowledge is power. And we truly believe that at black box intelligence, but we also believe that data can be offensive. And what I mean by that, so obviously it's a little bit of a double entendre, right? It can be offensive. You step on that scale or, you know, you can look at that and think, ouch, that hurts. Or you can think that kind of data helps me play offense. It helps me then know how to work the rest of this week, how much exercise to do, how much, cha- how many changes I need to make to get the result I want. So our data helps you play offense is the other way we look at it. And yes, knowledge is power. So our customers for subscribing, for being a part of our, what we would call our tribe and our community are better because they get the access to, we are about telling them how they are doing against the benchmarks, but then the the longitudinal studies that we do around the workforce and around tracking the most resilient brands and around understanding what guests and consumers are saying, there's a difference between what consumers will say they will do and what they do. And our data is pulling from all the social media platforms, Facebook, Google, and it's all the ratings that are given to restaurants that we are pulling in. But we're also then able to say, tell you everything they're saying. We're able to then distill it down with our proprietary software to say, this is what the consumers want from you, like the clean is the new ambiance. We, that's not what they said. It's actually, it's, it is what they said. It's not what they are telling you matters. It's what actually matters because it's what they are then saying after a meal. Uh, it's what they are then doing that we can track. We had um, surveys that we've been tracking with a partner, Lisa Miller and Associates, small research firm here in Dallas. We partnered with her and she was tracking what are people saying when, when, when they want to go out, what is most important when they want to go out. Uh, and, when, and she also was tracking uh, the cohorts of first out the door, I'm, I'm less anxious, and then to very anxious, I'm not going till this thing is over and there's a you know inoculation, not just a vaccine, but inoculation and herd immunity. And as we track that, we overlaid that with our sales and traffic data in terms of what we have tracked the industry doing since the beginning, and they laid together perfectly. So the more anxious that cohort was, the more very anxious, the less traffic, right? The more COVID cases in a month in certain states, the more those states were negative versus the others. I mean, it it all followed, Um, but we've got that because we're not saying, tell me if you're going to go out next week. We're actually saying, no, this many people did and the traffic moved this way um, and it's lining up pr- pretty well. So uh, as a member of our community or as somebody that just knows us and gets to see things like this, I'll tell you, we have some of the most, uh, you know, I think at this point, impactful information. I'll also tell you when the pandemic hit that the first thing we wanted to do was find ways to just give it away because re- because restaurants are our only vertical. They're the, that's where we sell. It's where our passion is but they needed us more than ever. And I hope we've been a, a lifeline for those that have, have started to you know, wonder if things are getting better and then look to our data and say, it looks like it was a good week. Maybe there's a turning point here. Um, we've also tried to be optimistic about what great resilient leaders have been doing uh, and what that looks like coming out of it as well. So I think they get thought leadership and they certainly get weekly, daily dashboards and insights from being with us, but then also access to, you know, I think a lot of the thought leadership that comes along with being a part of our tribe. I love that. Yeah, I think uh, it's really easy to get data drunk is what I say, Um, (laughs) meaning we have so much data now. Um, And there's a stat that I wish I could remember, but it's like, I feel like it's something around the lines of for every second, we have collected more data uh, than we did 30 years prior collectively. That's how much data is pouring in. So having a resource that can uh, culminate that data, distill it and output um, very digestible bits with the ability to dive deeper is invaluable. Um, and I'm in danger of sounding like a, uh, uh, an advertisement right now, but it really, the fact that you guys gave so much that away was very helpful to me and our clients at Vigor. And so I appreciate that so much because I was able to at least give tidbit, tidbits to our people and then also help guide what we want to talk about um, and what we need to talk about to 
like you said, take care of the guests, make them feel safe. And that is point number one. And I've said that countless times in, in phone calls, meetings on Clubhouse that, you know, let's not forget that we're not actually in the food business. We're in the safety business first, you know, and that's huge. Um so one final question before we wrap this up, and then I'm going to um, let you just plug away at uh, how to connect and where to find you and where to find Black Box. But uh, one piece of advice for thriving in post-pandemic world, what is it? Thriving in post-pandemic world, one piece of advice. Uh, you know, I think you've seen more flexibility, more, again, innovation, you know, uh, never a better time than in a crisis to, you know, think about, am I going to stay, stand still or move forward? And I think that flexibility of uh, um, reimagining uh, and and there's so much, there's space now because the consumer for any brand, they may have, sh- they may have shifted not only in their behaviors, but your demographic may have shifted. You may have all of a sudden become a bit more attractive to a, a different demographic, a younger generation, or, you know, perhaps a different ethnic demographic. And there's a lot of room for doing things differently for iconic brands that have been doing things the same for a while or had customers that got used to that favorite item. They're actually more forgiving of the changes going on, knowing that they're making changes in their own life. So I'd say continue you know, to thrive, um, continue to push on the things that uh, may make a difference today. It's a new playbook and uh, continue to seek out the information that's out there Uh, about what the consumers are are going to want from you. And there's room uh, to make maybe bigger changes than than we've even already seen that will help these brands truly, you know, truly thrive going forward. I love it. Uh, And all backed by data, of course. So uh, how can people connect with you and Black Box? Yeah, well, you, you did you you did all the heavy lifting for us on you know who we are and and what we share for the industry. So thank you so much for that. I, I love this. We I, I love it. So it's fantastic. And we are very simply blackboxintelligence.com. You can find us there. Uh, my uh, at Twitter at KB Palooza, which is different, has nothing to do with black box, but my handle. Uh, and there's all sorts of ways you'll find us in Nations Restaurant News every every month uh, with with you know ways to get back to us. You'll find us on MSNBC. Uh, with the restaurant watch every single week. And uh, we'd love to engage. We'd love to share our insights with anyone that wants it. And uh, we're always willing to talk about this great industry. So I thank you so much for the time to do this and uh, the time to share some, some thoughts. Yeah. And thank you so much for, again, more insights, more data and uh, a lovely interview. And uh, thanks for appearing. Of course. If you love what we served up, please follow us at Vigor Branding on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Medium. Fork Tales is produced by the team at Vigor. Audio and video post productions provided by Zencaster. Music performed by Jet Trash and licensed through musicbed.com. Joseph handles his own hair, makeup, and stunts. Copyright 2003 to 2021, Vigor Graphic Design, LLC, all rights reserved.